Attention is the rarest and purest form of generosity. These are the words of Simone Weil. In this episode of A Beautiful Gray Sponge, we're going to explore the magnificent mind of this philosopher, political activist, and mystic. With a depth of intelligence and heart, she lived her brief life fast and full, and not without criticism. Towards the end of her life, people thought, many people thought, that she was delirious. Um, as she became more and more mystical. But let's start with the beginning. Born February 3rd, 1909, Vey grew up in an attentive, affluent, and agnostic Jewish family in France, which included her famous mathematician brother, André Vey. At a young age, Simone was already a political activist at heart. Before the age of six, this little girl refused sugar during the First World War to show her solidarity with the French troops. And throughout her life, she sympathized with the working class. By the age of 10, she declared herself a Bolshevik. That's the far-left revolutionary Marxist group. And by her late teens, she identified herself as a pacifist, someone against violence, as well as a trade unionist. But her quench for learning and understanding continued to shape and change her, as we will see. Did she always remain a pacifist? As a young student, she learned ancient Greek by age 12 and was always interested in other religions and cultures. She even learned Sanskrit in order to read the Bhagavad Gita in its original text. She attended a prestigious French university and later taught philosophy to an all-girls secondary school. One student recounted that Simone had urged them to always do what will cost you the most. Always do what will cost you the most. Trying to find political solutions to human oppression, she still never fully trusted any organization. And by her late 20s, she became critical of Marxism fearful that elite bureaucrats would make life even more miserable for the working class than exploitative capitalists. Feeling guilty of her own privilege, she quit teaching, originally just as a sabbatical, to immerse herself in the life and experience of factory workers. Never known to be interested in physical attraction or intimate relationships, she chose to often wear men's clothes with no makeup and disguised her feminine frame. Originally holding a utopian view of factory work, she quickly realized the destructive and spirit-crushing labor this work life involved. She wrote, quote, Things play the role of men, men the role of things. There lies the root of evil. End quote. She even traveled to Germany in 1932, in order to witness the Communist German Party's movement. And these broken factory workers, she realized, could never create a revolution against a fascist authoritarian. And she was struck to see the rise of Hitler. Returning home soon after, she wrote about what was coming, but no one believed her. Within a year, her prediction came true. She wrote of war, quote, what a country calls its vital economic interests are not the things which enable its citizens to live, but the things which enable it to make war. End quote. As if the madness of humanity is only a race to power. Less aligned with pacifists by then and disillusioned with the organized left, in 1936, she chose to share in the fight and hardships with the workers' revolution in the Spanish Civil War, fighting in Barcelona, still believing that violence contaminated everything, yet also willing to use a gun. She'd admitted to a friend that she didn't feel at risk of killing anyone because of her nearsightedness, and her frail health soon forced her to return home anyway. About a month after she left, her entire unit was wiped out, and every woman was killed. 
she continued to write and published essays on labor, management, war, and peace. With the rise of Hitler and the increasing danger facing her Jewish family, in 1942, she traveled with them to New York, knowing they'd only consent to leave if she was with them. So, within a few months of settling them in, the United States, she quickly returned to London. Between this time, the late 30s and early 40s, she also wrote about her mystical experiences. She'd practically exhausted her intellectual reason, feeling unheard in an existential loneliness and instead began to go deeper into religious studies, especially within Christianity. She remained curious about many religions, like Greek and Egyptian mysteries, Hinduism and Buddhism, but believed that all contained elements of genuine revelation. She was also opposed to religious syncretism, or the merging of faiths. Quote, Each religion is alone true. That is to say that at the moment we're thinking of it, we must bring as much attention to bear on it as if there were nothing else. A synthesis of religion implies a lower quality of attention. End quote. Like politics, she never fully or officially joined any group or denomination, believing that even religion served as an institution to totalitarianism. Nevertheless, back in London and determined, she wanted to join the French resistance during World War II. However, she was too sick and would die 11 months later, August 24th, 1943, of cardiac failure, at age 34, to tuberculosis. She'd refused the proper nutrition to aid her in recovery. Once again, standing in solidarity with the least fortunate during the war, she'd accept only what little they received. Throughout her short life, she donated most of her income to political causes and charitable endeavors. Most of her writing was actually published after her death, and many well-known thinkers of her generation remembered her fondly. Even her rival, Leon Trotsky, a Soviet socialist, was influenced by her ideas, as the two would debate while staying with her family in France. Simone de Beauvoir, another female French philosopher, who ranked second in class to Vey while the two studied in the same French university, said after meeting her at age 18, I envied her for having a heart that could beat right across the world. And Albert Camus described her as the only great spirit of our time. She didn't seek fame or attention. She believed it was her writings that embodied the best of her. And we... We do our best between sharing and observing our own beliefs and living them out in our lives and actions, integrating and aligning them as much as possible. And then it makes me think of cognitive dissonance. A final quote by Simone Weil as we wrap up this episode of A Beautiful Gray Sponge. Simone said, The love of our neighbor in all its fullness, simply means being able to ask him, what are you going through? And this has been an episode of A Beautiful Gray Sponge, where we together explore the stories of great minds, the shoulders of giants on which we stand. Thank you so much for listening.